Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about work that I've been doing for the last eight years, working to resolve the time scale of events around the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. So at the core of this work is an important outstanding question in the field of earth science, and that question is what causes large scale global ecosystem collapse, such as that observed in mass extinction events. And so this is important not only for understanding these ancient events, but also for informing the future of our planet as modern climate change, sea level rise, deforestation, and pollution, among other things, are threatening global ecosystem collapse today. And so how do we go about determining the cause of a mass extinction event? Well, to do this, we need to be able to correlate forcing mechanisms, such as large meteor impacts, large scale volcanism, to observations of environmental change, like global warming and global cooling, and finally, to actual ecological change and extinction events. And so as a, at a first order, what we need to be able to do is correlate all of these different things in time. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on my work trying to answer this question for the Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary Mass Extinction Event. And so jumping into a bit of background, what do we know about the Cretaceous Paleogene Mass Extinction? Well, it occurred 66 million years ago, it's the most recent mass extinction event to today. It killed over 50% of the species living on Earth at the time. It led the way for the rise of mammals and the evolution of our own species. And finally, the reason this event is so wide known is because it killed all non-avian dinosaurs. And so the big question is, what killed the dinosaurs? Well, it's generally agreed upon in the community that a majority of these extinction events were abrupt and that they coincided with the arrival of giant meteor, which is recorded by the Chicxulub crater today in the Yucatan Peninsula. And so evidence for this includes abrupt extinction records in addition to an iridium anomaly uh, and other impact related things that are associated with the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary and extinction around the world. However, the impactor may not have been the only contributor to the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary mass extinction. So around the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, we also observe the eruption of the Deccan Traps. The Deccan Traps are a continental flood basalt, and they were erupting volumes of lava on a scale unlike anything observed on Earth today. And so in addition to these, or knowing that Deccan Traps was erupting around the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, we also observe records of late Cretaceous climate change, and then also some records of late Cretaceous ecological stress. And so all of this combined has led to the hypothesis that the Deccan traps played a role in the mass extinction event. But what was that role? Currently, we don't have enough information to fully constrain this. And so that is the objective of my research, which is trying to assess the role of the Deccan traps if it had a role in the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary mass extinction. And so to do this, myself and my colleagues worked to create a global high precision high resolution chronologic framework that tied together records of terrestrial ecological stress um, and terrestrial ecological recovery to records of climate change and finally to records of Deccan traps volcanism. And so for this work, we used two main tools, including argon argon geochronology and then also magnetostratigraphy. And so why did we pick these tools? Well, in order for our results to be meaningful, we needed to be able to correlate them to Cretaceous Paleogene boundary sites around the world. And this isn't easy as there are 350 sites around the world in both marine and terrestrial realms. And so what I'm plotting here are the four different geochronologic techniques that are commonly used to date Cretaceous Paleogene boundary sections in these different realms and for our two different triggers. And so what we can see looking at this plot is that argon-argon geochronology is the most direct way to tie our records of terrestrial ecological change to the Chicxulub impact and then also to Deccan volcanism. And further, if we can tie these to MAGSTRAT, that means that we can also correlate our records to those happening in the marine realm, which includes records of marine ecological change. And also this is where most of our climate change records live. And so jumping into our work, jumping into our work in the terrestrial realm. For this, we worked in the Hell Creek region of Northeastern Montana. And it's important to note that this is the boundary between the USA and Canada. And so we worked in this region because the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is really well defined here, um, both on, based on paleontology and then also we have an iridium anomaly. We also have a really good fossil record. Paleontologists have been working here for the last 50 years. 
We also have numerous volcanic ashes with material amenable to high precision argon argon geochronology. And then we also have good paleomagnetic recorders. And so for our work, we created a chronostratigraphic framework throughout the region um, using argon argon geochronology and magnetostratigraphy. And we worked really hard with paleontologists to try to correlate the paleontological sites to create a regional framework for how terrestrial fauna was changing around the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary mass extinction. So for this, we collected 33 ashes, 19 paleomagnetic sections, and this resulted in 3,000 single crystal total fusion experiments of sanity and collected from these ashes, and 285 paleomagnetic samples were demagnetized. And so an example of some of our argon-argon results, here I'm showing two rank order age distribution plots for two different samples that were collected from the same ash from two different sections in the region. And so this particular ash is located over here. It's about one centimeter above the impact horizon. And so this is our best way to date the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And so what we can observe by looking at our rank order age distribution plots is that our single crystal total fusion experiments um, overlapped within or with one another uh, within their uncertainty. Each of these bars is one sigma and each of these dots is a single crystal total fusion experiment. We also see looking at these that we're not seeing added complexities due to xenocris or inherited argon. So the interpretation of these ages is very straightforward. And then also plotted in here is our inverse weighted mean age, which is this red bar. And so it's important to note because these are two samples from the same ash from different locations, they should have the same age. And we do observe that their age or ages overlap within one sigma. It's also important to note looking at these ages, we're able to achieve high precision at about the 0.1% level. And finally, it's important to note for all ages presented here, I will be using the Rennie et al. 2011 calibration, um, but you should be able to translate to whatever calibration makes sense for your work um, and it will not affect the results of our study. And so because of the importance of that particular ash due to its proximity to the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, we dated about 600 more analyses than the ones that you observed on the previous slide. And by taking the weighted mean age of all of these, we were able to determine a new high precision age for the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary of 66.052 plus minus 8,000 years. And so this is the age that we're gonna be using for the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary in all of our future analyses and in all of the results that I will be showing further on in this talk. And so now as an example of our mega stratigraphic results, I'm going to show you our results from the eastern part of our region. And so what I'm plotting here, this is stratigraphic height versus VGP latitude, where when we switch from negative numbers to positive numbers, as we do here, this is implicating a polarity reversal. And so in particular, this is the Cron C29R, C29N magnetic reversal. And so in the four sections that we measured in this region, we identified this reversal within a or within a one meter resolution. And so this resolution allows us to correlate these different sections together at a level better than what's achievable by argon-argon geochronology alone. So by utilizing magnetostratigraphy uh, in this work, it's also helping us correlate our sites across the region at a much higher resolution than we'd be able to achieve with only direct dating. And so now combining our magnetostratigraphic, geochronologic, and paleontological results together, what do we observe? So we can see that mammalian decline began between 400,000 and 150,000 years before the mass extinction. We also observed that early mammalian recovery is constrained to the first 328,000 years of the Paleogene. We also see that the late recovery phase is constrained to between 328 and 850,000 years after the mass extinction. And finally, we see full mammalian recovery a million years after the mass extinction event. And so how do these results compare to records of climate change and records observed in marine sections? Well, now we'll move on to the second part of our work, which is calibrating Cron C20 NR. And so what I mean by calibrating here is that we're going to obtain high precision ages for the reversals that bound Cron C20 NR. Cron C20 NR is important because the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary falls in the middle of it. And this cron is commonly used for chronology in sections like marine sections where they do not have the means for direct dating. And so in order to date these reversals, we used our ages already obtained and our magnetostratigraphy already obtained from our sections in the Hell Creek. And so by having two dated horizons, that bracket 
a magnetic reversal, we can use linear interpolation to determine reversal ages. And so for cron C20 and R C20 and N, we were able to do this in six sections. And for C30 and C20 and R, we were able to do it in two. And so the reason that we determined the age in multiple sections was to mitigate any issues with sedimentation complexity and also to enhance our precision. And so looking at our pooled ages for these different section results, we can see that we're able to constrain pretty high precision for both of these cron boundaries. And then also we're able to obtain a duration for C29R of 587,000 years. And so now using this calibration, we can now correlate our terrestrial results to those from the marine realm, including records of climate change. And so by doing this, what do we observe? First, we observe that late Cretaceous warming ended about 150,000 years before the mass extinction. Uh, late Cretaceous cooling uh, was within the last 259,000 years of the Cretaceous. We also see that the onset of this climate change roughly coincides with records of terrestrial ecological stress. Um, and that here is marked by mammal evenness, while smaller numbers indicate increasing ecological stress. And then finally, we see that this long phase of recovery observed in the terrestrial realm is also observed in marine records. And so now the big question is, how does all of this fit in with the eruption of Deccan volcanism? And so to date the Deccan, uh, we went to the Western Ghats region um, of the Deccan Traps. And so that's the region marked by the box here. And so we picked this region to collect samples for a few reasons. Um, one is because this is one of the best areas in the Deccan Traps to get good exposure of Deccan lavas. You can see that really nicely here in this aerial picture uh, taken over the, West, or the Western Ghats. And then also this area records the largest volume of the Deccan Traps. And so it's the most likely location of the um, Deccan Traps eruptive products that may have caused that climate change in the late Cretaceous. And so for this work, we collected 100 samples across eight different sections and through all geochemical formations in the Deccan Traps in the Western Ghats region. And so for analysis, we only chose 36. And this was because we used thin section analysis to best determine samples that were not complicated by alteration to clay, and then also to choose samples that had the largest ground mass plagioclase. And so for analysis, we used multigrain aliquots of plagioclase separates. Um, we did not do ground mass, um, but we wanted the largest ground mass plagioclase for our plagioclase separates because they were most likely to have the highest potassium content. Um, and so an example of two of the samples that we selected for analysis are shown here in cross-polarized and plain polarized lit. And so looking now at some, or at an example of one of our age analyses, this is a step heating analysis of one of our samples um, that was repeated five different times. And so what we can see looking at one of our individual plateau ages is that over 70% of the gas is included within the plateau. And then also on replicate analysis, we're seeing that these plateau ages overlap really nicely and we don't have really any complexities in comparing um, our replicate analyses between each other. And so by taking the weighted mean of all of these replicate analyses, we're able to achieve pretty high precision um, on these reasonably calcic samples. And so now looking at the summary of our results throughout the Deccan Traps, this is stratigraphic height versus age where the blue dots are all of the ones, the new ones that were presented in Spring et al. 2019, the black were in Rennie et al. 2015, and then the red are some of the uranium lead analyses presented by Shaney et al. in 2015. And so what we can see is for the most part, we're getting pretty high precision in all of our ages. Um, there are some units towards the top that have pretty high calcium content, and so we're limited in what we can do there. Um, but for the most part, we've filled the entire stratigraphic um, section of the Deccan Traps. We have very high resolution on our dates. Uh, and then also we're getting nice stratigraphic superposition of our ages. And so the big question for the Deccan in trying to understand its role in climate is whether or not, it is where was the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary in the Deccan Traps? How much of Deccan was erupting before? How much after? And so we can see by plotting our Cretaceous Paleogene boundary age here determined in the Hell Creek that multiple of our ages overlap with this age. Uh, and so we need to do a different type of analysis to determine where is the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary intersections. And so for this, we used um, a Bayesian analysis using the Bacon age model on our Ambanelli-Gott section. 
Uh, and we chose this section because it was one of the only ones that had all of the potential locations of the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary located within it. And we chose one section instead of the cumulative section so that we didn't have to worry about any uncertainties in, in correlation between different sections. In this analysis, we determined the most likely position in the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary to be the bushy pole and port contact. Uh, and then this is consistent with the impact Turner hypothesis put forth by Richards et al. 2015. Um, and we can't disprove it with geochronology alone. And so jumping now into our results, where we're plotting cumulative volume now versus age. We see that 90% of the Deccan volume in the Western Ghats erupted in a million years, but 75% of this erupted after the mass extinction. And so now combining all of our results together, what do we see? Well, we see that our long recovery interval after the mass extinction in the marine and the terrestrial realm seems to correlate with the extended period of Deccan volcanism after the mass extinction. We also see that the onset of terrestrial decline and warming in the late Cretaceous is roughly coincident with the onset of Deccan traps. However, this only represents 25 to 50 percent of the lava released in the Deccan traps. And so this is confusing because we don't see significant climate change after the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary when that 25 to 75 percent of the Deccan lava was erupting after the mass extinction event. And so that's a big question. Um, the climate response of the Deccan traps is not what we expected. And so the assumption going into this was that the lava volume should be directly correlated to the amount of gas being released. And so where we have the largest volume of Deccan lavas being erupted is where we should observe the most climatic change. And that is not what we're observing based on our geochronology in the Deccan traps. And so in this way, the role of the Deccan is still unclear. Um, and so that kind of ends my work looking at geochronology and my future work on this topic of trying to better constrain the age of the Deccan traps is looking specifically at its earth system response. And so this is, um, I have two ongoing projects working on this. One is constraining the tempo of eruptions. This is a recently funded NSF grant. And the other is constraining the earth system response of volatiles being released from large igneous province eruptions. And so in conclusion, the role of the Deccan traps in the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is still a little bit unclear, but there's gonna be a lot more work to come. So please stay tuned. And so thank you. <laughs>